Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. The Road to Autonomy is brought to you in part by Stantec Generation AV. Stantec Generation AV combines some of the most experienced AV experts in the industry with the resources of a global engineering firm. Stantec Generation AV provides education, consulting, assessment, and guidance to any industry interested in autonomous vehicles. Learn more at Stantec.com. Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. I am your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to have Dirk Smiley, author, The Business of Tomorrow, The Visionary Life of Harry Guggenheim, from aviation and rocketry to the creation of an art dynasty. Dirk, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Grayson. Great to be here. I'm super excited to have you here. I was browsing my local bookstore here in Palm Beach, the classic bookshop, and looking for a new book to read, and I see this book, The Business of Tomorrow. I walked by and I see another book on P.T. Barnum, but something kept drawing me back to Business of Tomorrow. I said, what is the business of tomorrow? And I asked the nice lady at the bookstore, she said, oh, this book's selling really well. I said, okay, well, you just sold another copy. I want to read it. I opened the book up. I had no idea who Harry Guggenheim was or the important role he played in history. I read it. I was like, wow, this is interesting. So thank you so much for for coming on the podcast today. I would love to kick us off. Who is Harry Guggenheim? Harry Guggenheim is a third generation Guggenheim who was the head of the family for about 40 years. And he took over in 1930 when his father, Daniel, died. And Daniel had been the one who kind of took what was a small but lucrative collection of mining properties and built them into the largest mining conglomerate on earth. And this is all around the turn of the century. By the time that Harry takes over the family business, however, you know, the depression had just hit a year earlier. The stock market collapsed. The depression was kind of wreaking havoc on the stock market and on the value of things like Guggenheim mining stocks. So Harry took over the family business at a kind of a tumultuous time, but he really represented the guy who took the torch from the old generation of the Guggenheim family business, which mostly focused on mining, into a new era that had a lot to do with social impact investing in sectors like aviation and rocketry, but also a lot of very powerful philanthropy that he practiced over the years, right through the time of the building of the Guggenheim Museum in the late 50s, and then other projects after that. Harry Guggenheim is a kind of a transitional figure in the family business, in the family history. But I think he was the most consequential Guggenheim of the 20th century for all the reasons that I go into in my book. I want to point out, Harry wasn't, oh, Mr. Entitled. No, he actually rolled his sleeves up and worked in the mines, did hard work. You just talked about that in the book. Could you discuss that a little more in detail, please? He spent a lot of his early years down in Mexico and South America. He did an apprenticeship at the main mining property in Mexico, in uh, Aguas Calientes, where he just kind of learned how to sort ores and understood the economies of scale that were necessary to really create a, a successful mining business down there. And then a little later, he went and he essentially built a mining town in Chile. And that was a town near a property called uh, Chuki. It was the largest copper mine on earth at the time. Harry was tasked with building a a mining town of about 10,000, supporting 10,000 workers. He certainly learned a lot about construction in that phase of his life. But I think between Mexico and Chile, he learned a lot about how technology is brought to bear in mining, in particularly how certain refining processes were being used to take what would have been in the old days just like low grade ore and turning it into something that was much more lucrative because he found, or I should say his the, the family relied on people who could find ways to extract these valuable ores in a more efficient way based on new methods of metallurgical technology. I think he learned a little bit about the business. He learned a little bit about technology. And he also learned that he tended to have a record of landing in some of the wrong places in Latin America at the wrong time. In Mexico, he was there right before the revolution, and he got out just before it really began in 19, around 1910. And then when he wound up in a very different role as ambassador to Cuba, he, he landed there right at the beginning of the Cuban revolution, 1929, 1930. 
not all of his memories of Latin Central South America were glowing ones, but I do think he learned a lot from these positions. Putting his full character together, did he learn economics and curiosity, South America and Mexico in the mind, and then on the backside of that, he was a politically savvy as ambassador to Cuba. Is that when he really learned to hone his political skills? I think he did have a good deal of political savvy. I think, unfortunately for Harry, he was not playing with all the cards that he really needed to pull off a successful run as ambassador in Cuba, because you had this dictator, Machado, who initially had been democratically elected and then decided that he wanted to stay beyond one term and to eliminate any political opposition to any future election. The uprising began around that period when Machado refused to leave office, and it just got worse and worse as time went on. Harry serving as a mediator between Machado and some of the revolutionary forces, but he really didn't have the full power that he needed to negotiate a compromise that would have had any kind of lasting quality. So at the end of Harry's term at Cuba, the island was really on the brink of complete political and economic collapse. And eventually Machado was chased out a short time after the new ambassador came in under Roosevelt's first term. He had a very difficult time in Cuba, and I don't think it was really what he signed up for as uh, ambassador. Well, it might not have been what he signed up for. He gained access to presidents. He was able to to counsel presidents later in life. Could you discuss some of the relationships? I believe it was with President Kennedy. He had uh, also President Hoover that he had a relationship as well. That's true. He had entree with five different U.S. presidents over his lifetime, initially with Coolidge and then Hoover. And these were in the days when the aviation fund was in effect. And so he had established these relationships with the Commerce Department and the White House to advance the goals of the aviation fund. Later, he became very close to Eisenhower. Eisenhower was this kind of moderate Republican who Harry had a lot in common with. I think he had a lot of respect for him and also a lot in common in terms of where he thought the kind of public-private partnerships should be rolled out in the American economy. You probably remember this story about Eisenhower when he was kind of like a low-level officer after World War I when he was involved in some kind of an army convoy that went from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco, and it took something like 62 days. And then you fast forward later, after World War II, Eisenhower goes to Germany and looks at the Autobahn system and sees what a value that is to the to, to what it was to the economy there. When Eisenhower rolled out the interstate highway system, I think Harry had a lot of respect for that because he could sort of see the value of a national commitment to infrastructure, the best infrastructure that could be provided in that day, much as he saw aviation as a great value to the American economy, aviation infrastructure. So he and Eisenhower had a lot of the same ideas around these issues. And I think that was the president he was most close to. Kennedy, he met in the Oval Office later on after his wife, Alicia Patterson, had died. And actually, Alicia, who was the publisher of the newspaper, Newsday, that she had co-founded with Harry. Alicia had kind of cultivated a relationship with Kennedy. And then Alicia dies in 1963. And Harry kind of like follows up on that relationship. And it was a really powerful tool to be sort of endorsed by a newspaper like Newsday in those days, because it was, Long Island was heavily Republican. If you were a Democrat like Kennedy to be endorsed by Newsday, that would have been a coup. So that was partly Kennedy's motivation in continuing the relationship with first Alicia and then Harry. And then later on, Harry got a little time with Lyndon Johnson. That relationship didn't really go very far. Harry made some suggestions that Johnson that never really went anywhere in terms of restructuring the Latin American diplomatic portfolio. So that was probably his thinnest relationship with the five presidents that he had. But overall, I think that Harry kind of parlayed these relationships in a way that helped advance both the aviation fund early on and then other family enterprises as, as time time ensued. There's no doubt Harry did good for society. He did really good for, for innovation. He saw the business of tomorrow. But before we get into the business of tomorrow, before President Kennedy got the Democratic nomination, he sought out Alice at Newsday against Harry's wishes. And you document in the book, they had a private dining room and 
I forget the gentleman that was running. If Kenny got the nomination, sh- she would back him. He got the nomination, and Newsday comes out and endorses the Democratic nominee for president, John F. Kennedy. And then Harry writes in a blistering, said, "No, nope, we're going to we're going to nominate another." I, think, I believe it was Nixon. In the book, you documented a lot of tension in their personal relationship, but on the Newsday front, was that just kind of the bubbling up of everything? Is as Alice endorses Kennedy and and Harry endorses Nixon? Yeah, that was really an unusual feature of the newspaper where you had the publisher and the co-owner constantly disagreeing on political endorsements. The paper itself would get some negative coverage from time to time about, you know, why was there the split personality at Newsday? I think Harry felt entitled to do that given he was the majority owner of the paper. But Alicia was a very strong personality and she did not back down from Harry's ideas about how the newspaper might be better run, or he basically ceded to her for the most part when it came to major decisions about how the newspaper was run. I would say Harry deserves some credit for being tolerant of what was basically a sort of a liberal or left-leaning paper at the time, him being kind of a staunch Republican. And that example that you mentioned was such a good anecdote involving the future of an airfield in Long Island where Alicia gets this entree with Kennedy and sits down to lunch with him and basically in a matter of a 20-minute conversation manages to convince Kennedy to pick up the phone to call his FAA administrator to shut down an airstrip that she had been trying to get shut down and then use for, say, like educational purposes. And she had been unable to do that for several years. Well, one phone call from John F. Kennedy took care of that. But of course, that enraged Harry because he really wanted an airport, like a fully functional airport at that site. So she kind of defeated that effort with Harry's own newspaper, which was humiliating for him, to say the least. But it was just another bump in the road in this relationship that that newspaper always seemed to produce. Harry had to talk her in when they found Newsday was failed. She didn't want to do it. The airfield had to be deeply personal because Harry had this deep, deep personal relationship with aviator Charles Lindbergh. You documented their letters of correspondence in the book. Lindbergh did the famous Spirit of St. Louis flight. How would you describe Harry's relationship with Lindbergh? Well, Grayson, that is a really interesting relationship. It started when Harry visited Charles Lindbergh before he was famous. He was down at Mitchell Field getting ready to take off on his famous flight between New York and Paris. He wanted to see the plane that Lindbergh was going to fly because Lindbergh had been getting some attention. He was, I think, the youngest person to attempt this flight. But there are many other people at the time who were in the process of trying to make this trip and win this $25,000 prize that had been offered for it. But when Harry went to visit Lindbergh on the field, I think actually the plane was in a hangar at the time, Spirit of St. Louis, And he looked inside and the plane had been stripped down of every piece, anything that weighed anything significantly that Lindbergh could get rid of. He basically took it out of the plane. So when you looked inside the Spirit of St. Louis, you basically just saw an empty space with a wicker chair bolted into the floor, which looked very strange. And Lindbergh said, oh, please take a look, come inside. And he let Harry sit down in the in the chair, he's sort of leaning back and you can hear the wicker creaking. I think he considered that plane a death trap. And when he left Lindbergh, he gave Lindbergh no chance of succeeding. And of course he did. And then Lindbergh becomes the most famous man in the world. Ticker tape parade in New York, literally half of all New Yorkers came out to see that. Later on, not too much later, really a matter of a few weeks, Lindbergh was back and meeting with various people in the Commerce Department. So he reconnected to Harry at that point because Harry had floated an idea of Lindbergh doing this reliability tour, which involved him going to 48 states, visiting 82 cities along the way. And the idea was to prove that the the flight from New York to Paris was not a fluke. It was a function of the fact that aircraft really, generally speaking, were reliable and safe. And Lindbergh sought to prove that by landing at a different city every day at exactly two o'clock. And then he'd go through the same kind of protocols where he'd make a speech and then maybe there'd be a dinner and a parade. And then he'd get back in the plane and go to the next city. That was important 
in those days, I think, to people like Harry and and also to Lindbergh, because the the mindset around aviation was such that people considered airplanes to be the vehicles that barnstormers and circus acts used, or maybe these renegade male pilots like Charles Lindbergh. They certainly did not consider them to be any kind of a potential transportation of the future. So Lindbergh, with Harry's backing, really tried to change the narrative of aviation away from being this kind of risky, crazy, new futuristic transportation to something that could be a reliable and safe way to get around on a day-to-day basis, even though the infrastructure certainly was not quite there yet in the United States. But I think both Lindbergh and Harry felt like it was important to begin to change the psychology around aviation. And that really was the point, the reliability tour. The relationship grew over the years. I mean, it had some some ups and downs, particularly in the lead up to World War II, but they remained very close friends for 40 years. Even when Lindbergh got into a very different stage in his life where he was focusing on environmentalism and saving the blue whale, and they, they remained close friends right to the end. For listeners who might not be familiar, Lindbergh was actually looking at building a house on the property Harry owned on the Gulf Coast of Long Island, that tells you. And you did a really wonderful job about, you had these great stories about two men, two distinguished men, just going and fishing. All these things that they would just do together and and just talk and just learn. And one of those was rocketry with Goddard. Lindbergh got up in touch with Robert Goddard. And then all suddenly, off we go to rocketry. If you look back in history, what would have happened if Harry never met Lindbergh? Lindbergh never went on the flight. You could make the really clear into drawing the lines that we wouldn't be where we are in aviation today. We might not even have liquid cooled rockets. That's the important <laughs> role that this all telemetry it played in history. What are your thoughts? That's a really intriguing question, Grayson. There were a lot of players in the aviation business early on, but R&D development in particular was really lacking. And so were graduates of engineering schools that could be the workforce of the aviation business because there practically were no engineering schools at the time. The lion's share of Harry's money early on went to Guggenheim Aviation Institutes around the country, which graduated these aviation engineers and eventually formed the underpinning of the, the business of flight. But I would say if you look back to the years following World War I, before World War II, in the state of aviation, it was so backward compared to Europe. I feel that it's likely aviation would have followed more or less the same trajectory eventually, but it was these kind of spark plugs that Harry put into place that accelerated the sector. And I think you could make the case that the U.S. would have been a lot less prepared for World War II without Harry's efforts as far as the aviation forces in the military go. And when it comes to the rocket age, besides Robert Goddard and Caltech, I mean, there there just, there weren't any major rocket programs or research scientists that had devoted their life to this, this kind of fledgling sector. So that's why it was important for Harry's kind of bankrolling efforts with Robert Goddard over the years, the fact that he stuck with Goddard for so many years, even though he was just a single scientist. And, you know, in many, many years, he had some very limited success in terms of the elevations that his rockets were reaching. So it would have been very easy to turn away from Goddard and fund someone else or something else in in that sector. Caltech was his other bet, and Caltech was a program that eventually spun into the Jet Propulsion Lab, which, as you know so well, is created all these amazing exploration vehicles that we've sent far outside of our own neighborhood in space. I think these sectors would certainly have developed, but they would not have developed at the pace that they did, given the efforts of Harry and some other folks. That's kind of a long answer to your question, I guess. If you stay on the Robert Goddard topic, it started at at Aunt Effie's farm in Massachusetts, and he's blasting off rockets. And I'm like, wait a second, professor, this is like the nutty professor. And, Sir, what are you doing? And eventually, they went out west, and there was times on Harry's third honeymoon where the rocket didn't take off. And then they have the times where the military's interested, the times where we're not sure we're going to continue to fund this. 
there's a lot of up and downs with Goddard's work, but there was one consistency for, except for that little blip. I think it was after Daniel died. They always continued to fund Goddard's research. Do you feel that was Harry being loyal to Lindbergh or was that Harry truly believed in Goddard's research? Probably a combination of those factors, Grayson. I think that Harry staked a lot of his judgment on Lindbergh's opinions about Goddard's progress because you can see these letters coming back, back and forth between Harry and Lindbergh and then the reports that Goddard produced for the both of them. Goddard would produce a report, say, of like the last three or four months of rocket experiments and then he would send Harry this letter, and then he would send Lindbergh the letter, and then Harry and Lindbergh would sort of correspond on it. But Harry was very deferential to Lindbergh's assessments of Goddard's progress. So I think a lot of it had to do with Lindbergh's imprimatur on Goddard's work. At the end of the day, it was Harry who was having Goddard over to Falaise, his home on the Gold Coast, every year or so to come and basically lay out his progress for the year and what he planned to do the following year. And also it was Harry who reduced the span of time that the grants would be made from two years to one year. The initial grant was made really by Harry's father, Daniel, when he was still around. Harry was ambassador to Cuba at the time. So the first grant to Goddard came from Daniel, but again with Lindbergh's lobbying. So I think it was kind of a combination of the two, but certainly Harry deferred a lot to Lindbergh in terms of how effective Goddard was year to year with his various experiments. We talk a lot about the Daniel Guggenheim Fund for the Promotion of Aeronautics. How was the fund started? How was it implemented? And how are the projects chosen which will be funded and which will not be funded? Well, it started in the mid-1920s when Daniel got to the age where he was retiring from a lot of the Guggenheim enterprises. And he was really thinking about his legacy and how to spend this vast fortune that had been created. This was still before the Depression. So he was sort of like the Guggenheim wealth at its proportions. He had different ideas, like agricultural education was one thing he was looking into. But none of it was really all that exciting. Meanwhile, Harry was flying all over Long Island in his new plane and talking to pilots and comparing notes about how ridiculous it is that. The United States was the one who invented the airplane, and yet, you know, you fly around, and it's like, there's very few airfields to land on. There's certainly nothing resembling an airport. You couldn't get weather information. That was crucial to know if you're going on any great distance and flying, what the weather was going to be like when you landed. And there just seemed like there was so much need for infrastructure that wasn't there, particularly in the form of R&D and just education in general. There was a proposal that Harry got wind of at NYU to create a aviation engineering school there because it was that was the focus of a lot of um, student interest. And there was very little in the way that NYU offered in aviation education at the time. So they decided they wanted to build an aviation school at NYU, but that it would cost about 400000 And so the proposal was sent over to Harry. Harry had a contact among the faculty there. And the idea initially was going to be to raise the money from lots of different funders. And Harry's suggestion was that you're not going to get that kind of response by talking about a single school. So he said, why don't you let me take it to my wealthy uncles and see if they would underwrite this. So Daniel decided to underwrite the whole thing himself. And sometime later, the school opened at NYU. It just got the most amazing amount of positive press and publicity And the Guggenheims in that moment were kind of transformed from this family that was known for the mining business to these futurists, these people who were putting a lot of money behind a very kind of fledgling infrastructure at the time, aviation. And anyway, I think when they saw the buzz that this created and they had thought about it some more, they meaning Daniel and, and Harry, they decided to roll out an entire kind of national template for this kind of education, both in terms of engineering schools, but also like at the programs at Caltech. They did so many other things over the life of this fund. But the fund from the very beginning was set up to only exist for maybe four or five years at the most. And the idea was that it was a kind of an incubator 
an entity which would kind of plant these economic seeds, try to become a catalyst for advancing this sector of aviation, but then then they would basically close up shop. So it was a limited kind of social impact investing vehicle. And the idea was put the spark plugs in place and then let industry take over because Guggenheim certainly did not believe in any kind of sort of continual civilization for any kind of business or industry in America. They just wanted to try to advance what they saw was a industry that could move a lot faster if the right kind of economic spark plugs were in place. So that really was the concept of the fund. The economic spark plugs were definitely in place. There's a, a gentleman, who I'm sorry to say, with a very famous last name, probably everybody listening to this has flown on one of his aircrafts, William Boeing. Founder of the Boeing Aircraft Company received a grant from the fund for $290,000. I'm not sure what that is today with inflation, but $290,000 then from the fund. And it just so happened, Orville Wright's the chairman of the advisory committee. So you have Orville Wright, one half of the Wright brothers, William Boeing, founder of Boeing. Two iconic giants in the history of aviation were involved with the Guggenheim Fund. That's just a little tip of the iceberg of how large of an impact that fund had. Can you expand upon how large of a positive impact on society the fund had? Boeing was a really good example because his company was not all that large at the time. After he received the funding and after he actually began to produce graduates, there was a wind tunnel that the fund underwrote at Caltech. And Boeing at one point went to that wind tunnel to do tests on wing design as other early producers of airplanes did. And that was the kind of thing that any individual builder of planes would probably not be able to afford, you know, kind of building their own four-story wind tunnel. So that was the kind of R&D that I think helped. That was certainly one of the spark plugs that we were just talking about. But in terms of the larger economy and the larger culture, aviation really did transform America in the late 20s and into the 30s both in terms of commerce, but in terms of passenger service. I think much like the interstate highway system did beginning late 50s and early 60s under Eisenhower, I mean, it just transformed the ability of business, the potential of business in the United States. I think in that sense, it had its impact. It's also true that Harry and to some degree Lindbergh, they thought that aviation was going to be this force that would connect the entire world. And the one of the consequences of that would be cultures would understand each other better, <laughs> there'd be less conflict. And it sort of seemed like a good idea at the time. And I'm not sure they would have done anything differently had they known, you know, I mean, look at the role of aviation in World War II. I mean, it was, you know... <laughs> It was not exactly a mutual cultural understanding that was going on at that point. But you can sort of forgive some of these ideas. I mean, I think another concept Harry had early on, which never really came to fruition, was that rockets would be used to deliver mail. And, you know, again, it seems like a very kind of almost romantic idea that, wow, you could put a, put a piece of mail into your post office box at 9 a.m. in the morning, and then it would be delivered in Detroit at 3 o'clock because a rocket would get it there. So some of these ideas were sort of borderline crazy, but ultimately between aviation and then the rocket age, I mean, these are transformational sectors of business in the United States that in some ways really define the 20th century. Well, the idea of a rocket mail might have been crazy. There's a company years later called Rocket Mail. was just delivered over email. <laughs> it could be a drone that could deliver that. That's true. The spark plug was the fund that ushered in aviation. Are venture capitals say the spark plug that's going to usher in autonomy and autonomous vehicles? Are they acting as the modern day Guggenheim fund? I certainly think so. I think, I mean, when you talk about autonomous vehicles, which I am absolutely no expert on, Grayson, and you certainly are. But I think Harry would actually be really excited about autonomous vehicles because they do kind of represent another phase in the advancement of transportation infrastructure in the United States and having the potential to really kind of transform it in many ways. I wonder, too, whether 
the autonomous vehicle sector, vehicle sector could really use a Harry Guggenheim or, or a Lindbergh to demonstrate the safety of the technology and to bring that home to people. Because I think that at the consumer level, that seems to be still a big question mark in people's minds. I think someone like that, maybe they already exist or maybe they'll come along, but that could be a great help to the sector. We need, I agree, we need a reliability tour. And before Harry passed away, he had a plaque made at Falsy, which is his home and now a museum. And this plaque was really interesting, which ties directly into this. And I want to read this for you because this, this hit home. Goddard, America's father of the space age, sitting before this hearth in 1929, Carol Guggenheim noticed and read aloud to Harry Guggenheim and Charles Lindbergh the New York Times article about Robert Goddard's abortive rocket experiment out on Effie's farm in Massachusetts. Soon thereafter, Lindbergh arranged a meeting with Goddard, which was the first step in the Guggenheim financing of Goddard's pioneering develops in astronomics. This just happened from a 1929 New York Times article. Did this article help to usher in the space age and forever change history? I think it definitely did because that was the article that piqued the interest of Harry and Lindbergh one afternoon when they were sitting in the living room at Falaise. I think it was actually Carol Guggenheim, Harry's wife, who actually read that story aloud to them. And Harry and Charles Lindbergh had been talking a lot about kind of what is the next kind of upward extension of aviation? What's next? And rocketry being the obvious answer. I don't think they at that point had, other, other than the Caltech program, they had not really thought about any individual scientists that were worth investing in. Because you know, it's kind of a risky thing to place all your bets on a single scientist as opposed to an institution or say a group of people. I think that article really did serve as a kind of a catalyst to make the connection to Goddard, which then became someone who Harry bankrolled for a period of almost a decade. And he even took his third wife on the honeymoon to see a rocket launch. <laughs> and what a dud that was. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, Goddard, Goddard rolled out one of his rockets to launch, didn't even get off the launch pad. And then he thought, okay, well, I've got a backup rocket, which he then brought out. But on the way out to the test site, it was a huge rainstorm and it drenched everything, including that rocket. And Goddard, I think, just didn't want to risk it. I'm sure that Harry and Alicia thought they were going to be witness to some monumental rocket launch and it would be a, a metaphor for their marriage, this blast off and all the drama and everything. And, you know, it just didn't happen. But a second thing did happen, which was a very good thing in their life. And that was the acquisition of this newspaper on Long Island, Newsday. And that turned out to be a very lucrative and ultimately kind of influential business for both Harry and Alicia to be in. Goddard was a known quantity in the sense that he was known as really one of the original conceptualists around the idea of multi-stage rockets. And as you know, the multi-stage rocket was the basic design for sending men to the moon. Also, the idea of using liquid fuel propulsion as opposed to solid fuel that was another early idea of Robert Goddard's, which has continued to this day to be a way that we basically get our rockets up into orbit and beyond. Those were two concepts that Goddard had pioneered. I think that both Harry and Lindbergh realized the centrality of those ideas to what would be the coming rocket age. And that had a lot to do with giving the kind of confidence that Goddard needed in, from the likes of someone like Harry Guggenheim. And Harry had a wonderful line in which she would say, flying will be the business of t the future. In your opinion, what is the business of the future? Boy, that's a really great question, Grayson. I certainly think autonomous vehicles are a business of the future. And I'm not just saying it because I'm on your show today, but it's an exciting concept. When I was at Guggenheim Partners, I knew a gentleman named John Casesa. I think he knew an awful lot about this space. And I remember asking him, a devil's advocate question, I asked him, so what problem is autonomous vehicle solving? And he looked at me like I was out of my mind, and then he kind of laid out the whole concept. And particularly, I think they, they just add such huge margins of safety. That's, that's just really exciting. So I think that's a business of the future. Space in general, space investing, there's so much attention given to people like Elon Musk and Bezos and Branson. But there's also 
somewhere around 1,500 to 2,000 different companies now that have been formed around the world that are basically investing and developing business in space. I'm just really excited by the new James Webb telescope, which is like 100 times stronger than the Hubble telescope. It's going to identify things that we probably have never even imagined in the outer reaches of space, including habitable planets. If you take the phrase, I think that Elon Musk has sort of popularized multi-planet species. If we ever become a multi-planet species, it's great to know about these possible worlds that are out there. But in order to get there, we are going to have to accelerate our speed. And the research into ion engines, electromagnetic sails, there's so many different ideas that are being looked at as to how to do that. And I think once that barrier is breached, there's no telling where we could go in space. That's a particular sector that I think is going to grow and be of great interest to both people working in the sector and also investors. There's no telling where we're going to go. We all know that we're going to innovate and create new things. And I really, truly hope that when we, we get there and we achieve space breakthroughs, and perhaps there's a, another Harry Guggenheim, that you'll write a book. You wrote the beautiful, the business of tomorrow, the visionary life of Harry Guggenheim from aviation and rocketry, the creation of an art dynasty. On this conversation, we've only merely tipped the surface of Harry's life and what you covered in the book. And for a listener, if you're interested in the book, I highly recommend you buy the book. Dirk did a wonderful job of telling the story of Harry Guggenheim. Go on Amazon, uh, give him five stars. I gave him five stars or, or do what I do. As I said earlier, go to your local bookstore because the local bookstores are one of the greatest ways to discover new books. And that's how I discovered Dirk's wonderful book on Harry Guggenheim. And Dirk, as we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them? Well, I think if there's one thread that runs through Harry's life is the belief in the, the power of research in business. I know a lot of your listeners are people in the new economy and in the businesses of the future. I just think that that as a kind of an organizing concept in business is something that's really worth thinking about. And the things that go along with that, such as relying on alternative metrics, for example, come up with your own measures for determining what you're going to invest in, or even the sector of business that you're going to work in, kind of thinking outside the box in, in that way, I think is one of the things that I came away from studying Harry's life. That's certainly going to be a big part of the businesses of the future. Research can uncover worlds that you never knew about. You can become interested in a topic like I became interested in from research for autonomous vehicles and it's led me here and you never know what you're going to uncover. Perhaps you fall in love with aviation or rocketry, but we know that research is great. Reading books is one of the most enjoyable things you can do. And as I said, please go out and pick up a copy of The Business Tomorrow. It was a wonderful story on the life of Harry Guggenheim because the future is bright the future is autonomous, and the future is impact investing. Dirk, thank you so much for coming on the Road to Autonomy today. Great to be with you, Grayson. Thank you for listening to the Road to Autonomy podcast. If you've enjoyed listening, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Want to get in touch? Follow us on Twitter at Road to Autonomy or email podcast at B-R-U-L-T-E-C-O com. The Road to Autonomy is produced by Brulte and Company. The views and opinions expressed on the Road to Autonomy podcast do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Brulte and Company. The content discussed in this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal, tax, investment, or business advice. <laughs>